Well, uh, right now, I am in Paris, France. Uh, I've been here before. I've got a few videos of some different places that I've visited in this city, but I've never been right here. Uh, this is the Hotel uh, de Invalides. I think I mispronounced that correctly. And it is home to one of the largest military collections in the world, and also the tomb of Napoleon Bonaparte. So this is the Hotel Les Invalides, and I don't speak French, and what French I do speak is terrible. Uh, so anyway, I'm probably mispronouncing that. But anyway, uh, this was built at the behest of Louis the Fourteenth, and uh, the, the reason behind it is he was pretty sensitive to the fate of the military uh, servicemen who had served in his campaigns. So he decided to construct this huge residence that would be big enough to hold all of the officers who had been wounded in war or were elderly or frail. Uh, so construction began in November of 1671 and the first disabled soldiers uh, took up residence here in October of 1674. So it only took three years to build. There's a, a big court that's behind here and then of course the, the structure that dominates the whole thing is this cathedral. So we're gonna go in and uh, take a look around because uh, this is not only a historic structure, but it also houses a huge military museum and is the final resting place of Napoleon and some other pretty well-known figures. All right, well, uh, we just got in here and uh, got into the main courtyard and holy smokes, there is artillery everywhere. Uh, so we're going to take a look at that here in a minute. But full disclosure, uh, this was kind of a last minute decision for me. I had some other plans, those plans fell through, and then I made some more plans and those plans fell through too. So I I've never been here before, so we decided to come and check it out. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're just going to kind of be exploring and, and seeing things together in this video. All right, so uh, as I mentioned, there are cannons everywhere in this place. And I'll tell you what, when the French wanted to kill you uh, they, they wanted to do it in style uh, there are all kinds of interesting designs on these artillery pieces uh, so we'll just look at a, a few of them here uh, during the Middle Ages and Renaissance era uh, you know a lot of these artillery pieces would be decorated with like a coat of arms or a motto or an emblem to show not only who they belong to but also to assert the, the power and wealth of the sponsor. So, for example, uh, this one here, you can see the F. Uh, that indicates that this belonged to Francis I, uh, who was King of France from 1515 to 1547. Uh, it was under his reign that Jacques Cartier uh, does a lot of his exploration, like along the, the St. Lawrence River. Uh, and then back here, this, uh, this salamander is the, the emblem for Francis I, which is interesting to me. Here's an interesting one that has a little bit of this twist design on it. This is another one that belonged to Francis I. Uh, again, back here, we see his salamander, and there's also a, uh, a Latin phrase on here which uh, translates to, uh, I feed on the good fire and extinguish the bad. Here's another intricately designed cannon that was made during the reign of Louis XII. Uh, you can tell from the, the lilies here on this piece. Uh, Louis XII was the, uh, the king of France prior to Francis I. Uh, Louis XII died without an heir. Um, so Francis took over. Francis was his first cousin once removed and his son-in-law. So you can figure that out for yourself. Now this one 
might be my favorite so far. So this is an Algerian cannon, and they started kind of borrowing some of the design from the French, hence the lilies. But what I like about this is it's got this like reptile that's belching out cannon fire from its mouth. Uh, that is really cool. Now, this one is really cool to me, and I'll show you why here in a second. Uh, here we have the coat of arms of the Archduke of Austria. Uh, this cannon is from the late 1500s, and as we advance on, it has all of these designs. Uh, now, it, well, I said that this is my favorite. It's not because of this. It's not because of all the naked hairy men that are attacking each other, uh, but it's because of this. Um, so this is a lark that is adorning this cannon. And uh, the, the words here are from a, a Germanic um, myth where the lark is proclaiming this motto that says, when my song rises in the air, many walls are demolished by me. So in other words, when, when this cannon starts singing, things start breaking. And I'll tell you what, these things are cool as heck and I'm learning a lot as I go through here. Uh, I've got a couple like little siege mortar things here and look at this one. Look at this squatty little thing. This might be one of my favorites yet. That thing is just cool. I kind of want one of those. I put that in my backyard and turned it up on its end and use it to make homemade ice cream. <laughs> that is just one of the coolest pieces here. All right, we're gonna go on in the museum now. Uh, I mentioned that there's a, an expansive collection of military artifacts here. There are over a half a million military artifacts that range from like the Bronze Age all the way up to the, the 21st century. So obviously we're not going to be able to show them all, uh, but we're gonna pick out just like a, a small selection and uh, yeah, see what we can learn. All right, I just got into the military museum and uh, this particular part covers all kinds of military gear from uh, Louis XIV all the way up to Napoleon. So we're talking 1643 into the 1820s. And I can tell you right now, there is a 0% chance that I'm gonna be able to show everything in here, but we're gonna catch a few highlights, just some things that catch my eye. All right, now, of course, the thing that's going to catch my eye, of course, is going to be the firearms. And I want you to take a look at this thing right here. Uh, this is a Rampart musket from the 1690s. It's a, a flintlock. And look at the length of this thing. Uh, this is 3.7 meters long. I don't even know how you would shoot this. Like, if you shouldered this thing, it would feel like you were looking down a telephone pole or something. Uh, they also have this blunderbuss here that would be used like in ditches and angles in fortifications. Pretty cool weapon. And this is something right here that I've never seen before. Uh, this is a grenade launcher from, uh, let's see, the 1700s. It's got this spike that you would dig into the ground to absorb the recoil. That thing is really cool. Yeah, this is very, very fascinating. All right, got a few more weapons here uh, but what I really wanted to focus on is uh, this guy over here uh, this is Count Gravier de Vergin and you may not have ever heard of him uh, but he was head of the foreign office after 1774 in France and was a great friend to the United States he was really opposed to British power and uh, helped the American colonies fight their war of independence uh, he favored Lafayette and uh, sent a lot of weapons to the insurgents. Yeah, interesting. What in the heck is going on here? Uh, a little sign said that this is an eight shot matchlock rifle. And wow, that 
is weird. I have never seen such a thing. Now you knew that at some point we would have to talk about Napoleon Bonaparte and take a look at some of the artifacts that they have in this museum. This is really incredible. So this is a hat that belonged to Napoleon. And then if we look here, this uniform that we're looking at uh, was worn by Napoleon at the Battle of Marengo in June of 1800. Uh, they also have some swords that belong to him. Um, this set of pistols and then they also have another set of pistols over here that belong to Napoleon and then these swords were also his yeah that is incredible here we have probably one of the more famous paintings of Napoleon when he became emperor. And uh, also here in this room, they have the frock coat made completely of silk or silk velvet of one of his close confidants, a guy by the name of Marshall Lanz. Now, this is pretty interesting. Uh, this is an Arabian horse that was gifted to Napoleon by Selim III, who was the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and after the horse died, well, he was mounted. Uh, here you can see the, the brand of Napoleon. And then it was kind of lost for a while and was rediscovered during the Franco-Prussian War. And, uh, yeah, now he's here. Interesting. All right, uh, moving into another section where they are showing some French armor and take a look at this. This is something that I've seen on numerous history websites and web pages, but to see it in person is something else. This is the breastplate of a guy named Antoine Favreau, I think I'm saying that right, uh, who was killed at the Battle of Waterloo on the 18th of July, 1815, when he was struck right in the chest by a cannonball. Here you can see uh, both the entry and the exit. Man, that is something else to see this in person. Got a few more Napoleon artifacts here. Man, this is incredible. Uh, so here we are looking at uh, his campaign bed and also his dressing gown. Uh, that he would have worn at night. Uh, also, they have his writing desk here. Uh, and then you can see his hat laying on the bed. And uh, this is the bed where Napoleon breathed his last breath. Well, that was exceptionally interesting. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's over half a million pieces here. Uh, they have a big collection of World War I, World War II. Uh, but since we're coming off some of the Napoleon stuff, I think we're gonna go in here and take a look at the final resting place of Napoleon Bonaparte. All right, well, uh, we just entered into the Royal Chapel here, and uh, man, uh, this place is something else. Uh, to quote a friend of mine, uh, you sure could stack a lot of hay in here. Uh, so Louis XIV spared no expense in the building of this chapel, and you can see, you know, all kinds of, like, gold decorations here to remind us that it's the Sun King who commissioned this. Uh, now, Napoleon is buried in here, but there are some other famous French people who are buried here as well. All right, well, uh, right here is the tomb of Vauban. Uh, this was a military engineer 
and Marshal of France who worked under Louis XIV and was considered to be like the greatest engineer of his time. A lot of fortifications in France were built um, under the command of, uh, of Valbonne. Also laid to rest here is Ferdinand Foch, who was the supreme allied commander during World War I. Uh, this guy was a hero of France, hero of the First Battle of the Marne. Uh, as the, the Germans were advancing, uh, he, he has a quote that I absolutely love where he says, uh, My center is yielding, my right is retreating, situation excellent, I am attacking. And this, this man, uh, as I mentioned, was a, a hero of France during the First World War, uh, would accept the uh, German surrender in November of 1918, and uh, is laid to rest right here. All right, we're getting ready to go down into the tomb of Napoleon. And uh, before you do, they have a couple other tombs here. One for a good friend of Napoleon's by the name of Duroc. Uh, he later became Marshal of the Palace. And uh, also one of his generals, a guy by the name of Bertrand, who uh, accompanied him to Elba and St. Helena and brought his body back to France after he died. And then you have this door that leads down to the crypt and uh, there are statues on either side one holding the uh, crown of Napoleon the other one holding an imperial orb and a sword uh, and then you go through this door and down these steps to the final resting place of Emperor Napoleon well, right here is the final resting place of Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, before anybody cracks any jokes about his height, I, I've seen some history sites that say he was like five foot two, which is completely ridiculous. He was about five foot six, which was average height. And uh, you can see the sarcophagus is resting on top of a big slab of green granite. And uh, the, the sarcophagus actually has like a nest of five coffins. One of them is made of iron, another of mahogany. Uh, there are two that are made of lead and then one of ebony. And inside uh, rests Napoleon. He's dressed in his colonel's uniform, uh, has the, the sash of the Legion of Honor, and his hat is resting on his legs. And this is probably one of the more visited places in Paris, and for good reason. Uh, the, the man is uh, a legend and rests right here. Well, that was pretty dang cool. I'm, uh, I'm glad that uh, I made the decision to finally come by here today. Uh, and when I say that I didn't even show a fraction of a percent of what is in there, I, I'm not kidding. I mean, it, it is wild how many things they have from all kinds of different military conflicts. And then to see the, the tomb of Napoleon uh, was, was pretty interesting as well. Napoleonic Wars is something that my knowledge is only really surface level. so. Uh, this, this makes me want to buy some books and, and learn more. But anyway, that was the uh, Hotel de Invalides.